you with all his life. How much life does he have left if you don't trust somebody? Call the police. I don't think he's going to get money. This isn't a 50 or a 100 to let a horse room stay open. It's minions. If anything happens to me, wait three days. Nobody comes by and gives you the code name. I want you to mail the book. On this episode of Old Joe's Reminiscence, a former pro basketball player is on the run after gathering incriminating evidence against his syndicate-backed current employer. Can Nick Bianco locate the missing man before the hitmen do? The search is on. Tony Franciosa stars. I'm about to review episode 19 of Search, and once again I have no memory of watching it. This episode first aired on Wednesday, February 28, 1973. There will be spoilers ahead, so if you haven't seen the episode, get a copy of the DVDs and take a look before we peruse the Matson Papers. This episode's teaser did nothing to jog my memory, so it looks like I'm starting with a clean slate again. The episode opens with what I'm going to guess is a Lincoln Continental parking in front of a small shopping center. A man gets out and is walking along the sidewalk carrying a briefcase. He's former pro basketball player Holly Matson, played by Terry Carter. Terry Carter was born on December 16, 1928 in Brooklyn, New York. He began his career with television appearances in the mid-1950s. He was a regular, playing Private Sugarman on The Phil Silvers Show. In 1965 he became the first person of color to be hired as a TV news anchor at WBZ-TV in Boston. He made many appearances on television shows over the years, but he is best known as Sergeant Broadhurst on 42 episodes of McLeod and as Colonel Ty on 21 episodes of the late 1970s series Battlestar Galactica. A young man who we see polishing a delivery van calls out to Holly and shows him some basketball moves. I would be rather annoyed by that, especially if it happened every time. I liked the camera work they used, filming through the windows of the delivery van when that other car arrived with its two occupants. Matson enters a wine shop where he's escorted to a secret room where there's a wall safe. You usually call, Holly. Wasn't time. He places some papers in the safe and tells the man that if anything should happen to him, he should wait three days, and if nobody shows up with the code, he's to mail the envelope to the post office box. I won't even look at the name. Be my guest. It's a box number. Well, to carry out a little fiction, perhaps I'd better send the case of the bar girl out of the house. Let's hope I live to enjoy it. The wine shop man looks familiar, but I can't place where I might have seen him. He's been in a lot of things, though. He's Marcel de Marnay, played by Ivor Francis. Ivor Edwards Francis was born on October 26, 1918 in Toronto. He was busy performing on stage and radio in New York City, but when Broadway began concentrating on musicals he went west to California. He did films and television, including daytime soaps. 
He made many guest appearances over the years and he had a recurring role on Room 222. Ivor Francis died just a few days shy of his 88th birthday on October 22, 1986. When Hawley is about to get back in the Lincoln, a man pulls a gun on him and tells him to get in the black limo. He's Earl Forbus, played by Don Pedro Colley. Don Pedro Colley was born on August 30, 1938 in Oregon. Growing up, Don was into sports like football and track and field. He tried out for the Olympics in 1960. He was on a career path to becoming an architect, studying architecture at the University of Oregon. He happened to join some friends for a play rehearsal and was bitten by the acting bug. He appeared on dozens of shows and movies such as Beneath the Planet of the Apes, but he is best remembered for his role as Sheriff Little on the Dukes of Hazard television series. He was active until his death on October 11, 2017 following a long battle against cancer. As the two men pass the delivery van, that young man calls out to him again. Show me your hookshot. This is enough of a distraction that it allows Holly to throw the briefcase and run. The thugs take off after him and the kid runs away with the briefcase. Holly eventually gets away in the back of a truck. We cut to Probe Control, where Burgess Meredith, as VCR Cameron, is showing Omega Probe Nick Bianco footage of a basketball game. Yeah, that's Holly Manson, playoff game with the Knicks. Three years ago, when he said a championship scoring record, how many times do we have to run through this? Well, if you're going to fast yourself off in Travis, Texas, as Holly Matson's best friend, you better have a few pertinent details. Nick needs to get to know as much as he can about Holly Matson so he can pose as Holly's best friend. Nick perks up when he sees a photo of Sugar Francis, Holly's old flame and one-time fiancé, from a decade ago. There's a detail worth studying. Ten years ago, Matson was engaged to Sugar Francis, nightclub and television singer. Engagement broken one year later. Longtime character actor John Kerr is playing Senator Gordon in this scene. Now what has this got to do with the head of the Senate Select Committee? Matson contacted my committee. Matson has information that goes right to the heart of the syndicate. But Matson has disappeared, and they want Bianco to find him. So Nick is off to Texas. There's a cute girl behind the counter at the car rental booth. IMDB doesn't list her. She's not even in the list of uncredited actors for the episode. A quick glance in a car mirror that he passes tells Nick that he's being watched. I think this is my favorite of all of the disarming the bad guy scenes that we've seen so far in this series. The man is Leonard Crawford, a hitman out of Detroit. He's being played by Tony Epper, who's appeared in nearly a hundred film productions as a minor player, and he did stunts in a hundred more. I have a feeling that we haven't seen the last of Mr. Crawford. Nick visits Lenore Matson, played by Ella Edwards. She doesn't believe Nick when he tells her he's a friend of Holly's. I don't believe you. She's his wife. She knows all his friends. A guy like me barges in, a guy you never met. Now I can understand. Get out of my house. The doorbell rings. <coughs> which triggers my dogs to bark incessantly. After I finally got them calmed down, 
I restarted the video to see Bianco checking out the Matson's family designer telephone. Hey, copy, Bianco. Nick, the phone is bugged. Electromagnetic sensor plate. You can relay transmissions over limited range on ultra high frequencies. Now, earlier I heard Cam mention an unfamiliar name, but it didn't dawn on me until right now that Harris isn't at his station he's manned since the mid season support cast changeup. This time, it's fellow Pittsburgher Fred Holliday as a technician named Grant. He's sitting in for this one episode. Nick picks up the phone and starts talking so Probe Control can get a fix on the bug signal. And that's when Mrs. Matson comes back into the room with a policeman. Thinking back on it, I guess the police would have had the house under constant surveillance in case someone would try to harm Holly's family. Bianco could be a hired assassin sent by the syndicate for all they know. At police headquarters, Nick meets Walter F. Garrett, the chief of police. I know all about you, Bianco. Specialist in syndicate operation. To me, you're a born troublemaker, and I want you out of my jurisdiction. Well, you worked fast, Garrett. You had the meds in place staked out, didn't you? He's played by Cameron Mitchell of High Chaparral fame. Cameron Mitchell was born on November 4, 1918 in Dallastown, Pennsylvania. He started acting prior to serving as an Army Air Force bombardier in World War II. He appeared on Broadway and in an experimental television broadcast. He continued both film and stage performances following the war, making his film debut in 1945. With hundreds of film and television credits, Mitchell is best remembered for his role as Buck Cannon in 97 episodes of The High Chaparral. Cameron Mitchell died on July 6, 1994. He's appeared in so many shows, you just had to have seen him in something. Chief Garrett is a gruff fellow, and my first guess says he's a dirty cop. Garrett wants Bianco out of his town. He's on the phone arranging a flight for Bianco when Nick mentions the bug on the Matson House telephone. That gets the chief's attention. Garrett lets Bianco see the police report from Matson's disappearance. Tommy, the delivery driver, hasn't shown up. Garrett says Matson called his wife, and it wasn't a local call. With that information, Bianco is off to see Paul Kleinschmidt of Sabine Industries. Mr. Kleinschmidt is played by Tim O'Connor, who I recognize as Dr. Hewer from Buck Rogers. Tim O'Connor was born on July 3, 1927. He began his acting career on stage at the Goodman Memorial Theater in his hometown of Chicago. He moved to New York at a time when television was becoming popular, and most shows were produced on the East Coast. He moved to California with the medium and became a popular guest on scores of shows. He is best remembered for his role as Elliot Carson on hundreds of episodes of Peyton Place, and as Dr. Hewer in 21 episodes of the 1970s Buck Rogers series. Tim O'Connor died on April 5, 2018. Kleinschmidt also says that Matson is alive. Other than that, he's no help. We cut to the wine shop. Marcel de Marnay appears to be closing up his shop at the end of the day when there's a knock at the door. A cop is there to take him in. Mr. De Marnay? Yes? I'd appreciate it if you came along with me. Just a few questions. Of course. I'd like to get something in my office, if you'll excuse me. He heads for the back door, but there's another cop waiting there. Those two cops rough him up, and how. They're trying to find out where Matson had gone, but when the old man won't talk, they give up and leave. In Act 2, 
Nick locates Tommy, that delivery van driver. Tommy is played by Ty Henderson, who was playing a lot of bit parts on TV at that time. He appeared on Room 222 in the early 70s. Tommy gives Nick the briefcase, which doesn't appear to contain anything of importance. Cam breaks in with an update on Sabine Industries' finances. They were in trouble at one point, and it seems that Kleinschmidt had overcome some of his money troubles by borrowing $20 million from Lebanese banking interests. Cut to Sabine Industries, where Kleinschmidt has a clandestine meeting with Earl Forbus, that hired thug who had shot at Matson. You said for me, Mr. Kleinschmidt? Just so we understand each other, I do not want Holly Matson hurt in any way. What are you waiting for? Cam has been monitoring police frequencies, and he informs Bianco about an ambulance call. We see a bloodied DeMarnay on a hospital gurney being wheeled past Chief Garrett. Bianco comes in. The chief says that the man is in a deep coma. Garrett is paged to a phone. The cops watching the Matson home tell the chief that Holly's talking to his wife. Come on, get off the dime. Where did he call from? Where? All I know is it was a Los Angeles exchange. The Los Angeles exchange. Probe Control is also listening in. Surprisingly, they weren't able to trace the call. How about that? they were able to filter the recording to enhance the background. It's Sugar Francis, and Nick just happens to have a trade newspaper with an article stating that she's recording at a studio in L.A. They really got good use out of that helicopter footage they'd shot for the gold machine because Nick is about to take a helicopter ride to Los Angeles. Nick just walks right in the Sugar's recording studio. Francis? Who let you in? Oh, I just walked in. Nobody stopped me. Nick convinces her to take him to Holly, and of course she does. I can't believe that he's running her expensive Rolls Royce through an automatic car wash. I'm just screaming, no, no, no! You hand wash a Rolls Royce! I worked at a car wash back in the 1970s. It made me sick just thinking about that Rolls Royce going through those brushes. And they probably did multiple takes. Yikes! Bianco tells Matson that they can provide protection for Holly and his family. But as he's saying that, Leonard Crawford takes a shot at Holly. I thought they weren't supposed to harm him. While Nick and Lenny duke it out in the car wash, Holly steals a green Mustang from the hand drying area and he takes off. Earl Forbus goes in pursuit. It doesn't look good for Holly Matson. As Act 3 begins, Nick is behind the wheel of Sugar's Rolls Royce. Are you thinking he'll head back to your place? He's got a choice. They pull into the parking garage where they find Holly's body slumped over half in and half out of that Mustang. <laughs> Holly had traced a partial clue in the leaked fluid on the floor. Freeze frame. M-A-N-T-I-N. Cam and the team are on it. 
Just for kicks, I googled Manton, and I came up with a town in Malaysia, a manufacturer of injected molded plastic packaging, and a professor located in Luxembourg. Oh, we're back to Luxembourg, are we? Wait, that was C.R. Grover's case. No, Nick won't go to Luxembourg. He's headed back to Texas, where he's met at the airport by Chief Garrett. Yeah, L.A. told me about it. Oh, yeah, I figured you'd be back. You figured right. I need some answers, Garrett. How did the guy who hit Holly Matson know that he was in Los Angeles? Don't ask me. Don't ask you. You're the one who had the tap on Mrs. Matson's phone. When Nick goes to see Kleinschmidt again, he has a brief conversation with a man named Campbell. What do you do, Mr. Campbell? As little as possible, Mr. Bianco. I have investments. Say by A mm, few shares. Property in the Caribbean, South African mines. You see, my late lamented father, he was a doer. I'm what you call a spender. Unfortunately, he set it up so I can't even do that as well as I want to. Mm. That's tough. Really tough. I try, Mr. Bianco. Lord knows I try. Oh, I'm sure you do, Mr. Campbell. I'm sure you do. Bob Campbell played by Richard Lepore. We've seen him before in episode 8, In Search of Midas. When Kleinschmidt does arrive, he says he had nothing to do with Holly Matson's death. You are a lousy hypocrite. You set up Holly Matson. That's a lie. I had nothing to do with his death. I'll believe you when you give me what Holly Matson had in his journal. Do you understand? Now, if I get that, I'll fight to save your hide. The usual Bianco method? Shake them up and hope something comes out. Hmm? Sometimes it works. Now fill me in, Cameron. It always bugs me how Bianco pronounces Cameron. Cam has his results for Manton. M-A-N-T-I-N. We've run it through our files of syndicate names and pseudonyms. We've checked it against all residents of Travers, Travers County. Okay, okay. Then we try the Oxford Dictionary and Cohen's Encyclopedia of Historical References. I know you're thorough. Mantonique. It's a vineyard in the Loire Valley, bombed out of existence in 1944. Wait a minute, wait a minute. A vineyard? We cut to Marcel de Marnay, who has conveniently come out of his coma just in time to talk to Bianco. Montanique. Montanique was something in code, wasn't it, between you and Holly? Is that right? When Bianco mentions Montanique, the man spills the beans about the safe and the journal. He'd mailed the envelope just before his collapse from his beating. Kleinschmidt calls Bianco to arrange a meeting. Paul Kleinschmidt is trying to reach you. Hold on, we'll patch you in. Go ahead, Bianco. Bianco here. Bianco, I think we'd better meet. And just so we understand each other, it's not to save my own skin. It's what I owe Harley Matson. Kleinschmidt enters an elevator. The camera follows the elevator down one floor, where Earl Forbus exits, leaving the body of Paul Kleinschmidt behind. In Act 4, we see a covered body being loaded into the back of the coroner's hearse. Nick goes to Matson's widow. I'm just sorry I couldn't tell you any of this before. I met Holly just a short time ago, but he's the kind of man that I knew that I could trust. She doesn't know anything, but we get the revelation that Matson and Chief Garrett were friends. I forgot about this, but I don't think this is what you want. It's a committee that passes on scholarships. Holly was the chairman. I see. And uh, Chief Garrett was the secretary. Holly and Garrett were close? Very. They used to see each other often. That's very interesting. Nick confronts Garrett to find that he has Matson's notebook hidden away. How about turning it over to Senator Gordon and his committee? <laughs> you think it's that simple? He's afraid to turn it over, fearing for his life and the lives of his family. He's already sent them out of town. He's at the airport. I checked it there this morning. Wait a minute. I usually don't carry them. Make me feel better. He agrees to take Bianco to the notebook, 
but his office is bugged. They retrieve a briefcase containing the notebook from a lockbox at the airport. In the airport parking lot, two cops pull up in a black and white. It's just a black and white. And it was two cops who beat up to Marie. Garrett brandishes his service revolver and takes out both of the bad guys. Campanella had anglicized his name to Campbell. He's been right under Bianca's nose all along. You lose, Campbell. Double or nothing, Bianca? Come on, come on, come on. You found the journal. But you know I didn't have to. Once I made the tie-up between Caribbean distributors, Gaetano Campanella, and Mr. Bob Campbell, everything just fell in place. Well, you don't object to my anglicizing my name, do you? <laughs> Hey, listen, I'm not chauvinistic. Gaetano was your father, right? Well, I told you. He did provide for me, you see. Uh, when he died, I just stepped into his shoes. You're finished here, Kim. You know, Miss Bianco, I was getting to like you. I'm so sorry you found that germ. While Bianco is talking to Campbell, the man's quick glance alerts Nick to a gunman sneaking up behind him. Nick ducks just in time and returns fire, killing Earl Forbus. Campbell crawls, reaching toward Earl's revolver, but Nick stops him. Matson file case is closed. This was another interesting episode, and I didn't dislike Bianco in this one. I know, I'm showing my bias. It had a lot going for it, though. A diverse cast of characters without bigotry and very little cultural stereotyping. It featured some very interesting camera work. That shot through the van's cab, following the elevator down for a surprise reveal. And that location shoot in the small shopping center was a nice touch too. As was the car wash location. And did you notice the price of gas at that Arco station in the background? under 40 cents per gallon. I'm wondering if that was a product placement in exchange for being allowed to shoot at Arco Plaza. In my opinion, this was certainly one of the best Bianco episodes yet, and I'm really surprised to find that he didn't meet anyone he knew from his days on the Crime Commission. I feel Kleinschmidt deserved what happened to him, but I really wish Nick could have gotten Holly out before the bad guys got to him. So, if you enjoyed this review, tap the like button and be sure to check out all of my search reviews. If you're not a subscriber, smack the subscribe button. I'm getting close to the end of search and I'll have some additional content later on, but I'm thinking about where to go from here. Star Trek was my absolute favorite of all times, but that's been done to death. I'm considering several lesser-known series and maybe a few unsold pilots. I'll have to see what I can get past the copyright blocks. It's very frustrating to spend weeks on a project only to have it blocked for copyright. But stick around and don't forget to activate the notification bell so you'll know when they finally hit. Until next time, save it!